The Taliban is in control of Afghanistan. The country's president has fled, and Western countries are scrambling to get people out. And this took the U.S. by surprise. I did not, nor did anyone else, see a collapse of an army that size in 11 days. But that's what happened. Across the next few minutes, let's go through how, after 20 years of war, this unfolded so quickly. Afghanistan's a country of 48 million. It shares lengthy borders with Iran and Pakistan. And in 2001, a U.S.-led coalition removed the Taliban from power following the 9-11 attacks. Al-Qaeda had been allowed to use the country as a base. With the Taliban out of power, an elected government followed. But the Taliban didn't go away. Years of fighting followed. Tens of thousands of Afghan troops, militants and civilians died, as did thousands from the U.S.-led coalition. And in 2020, after direct talks between the Taliban and the Trump administration, a deal was done. The Taliban would not attack U.S. troops. The U.S. committed to leave. And in April, the new president, Joe Biden, recommitted to that withdrawal. I've concluded that it's time to end America's longest war. It's time for American troops to come home. And while America's NATO allies expressed concern, they concluded, with the Americans going, they had to, too. And so the withdrawal gathered pace. By July, a symbolic moment was reached. This is archive footage of Bagram Air Base. It was a central facility to the U.S.-led operation in Afghanistan. And on July the 5th, in the middle of the night, the Americans left Bagram for good, without telling the base's Afghan commander. Several days later, the 8th of July, President Biden was asked to assess the risks he was taking with this withdrawal. Is a Taliban takeover of Afghanistan now inevitable? No, it is not. Because you have the Afghan troops have 300,000 well-equipped, as well-equipped as any army in the world, and an air force against something like 75,000 Taliban. It is not inevitable. That 300,000 figure, though, is contested because of corruption and desertion. There were questions about the real strength of the Afghan military. Nonetheless, in the following weeks of July, the U.S. continued its withdrawal and the Taliban continued to intensify its operations. By the beginning of August, the Taliban was taking territory it hadn't occupied for 20 years. This map shows Taliban-controlled areas in red, contested territory in yellow, and regions under government control in blue. Then, on the 6th of August, came another strategic and symbolic moment. The Taliban took its first provincial capital. Zaranj is a city on the southern border with Iran. In something that would become a pattern, it fell without a fight. And Afghanistan made this plea to the UN. The Council must act and prevent a catastrophic situation. We are alarmed by reports and incidences of gross human rights violation by the Taliban and their foreign terrorist associate in almost half of our country. That alarm will have grown. Between the 7th and 10th of August, the Taliban took eight more provincial capitals, mostly without resistance. By now, a quarter of Afghanistan's biggest cities were in its control. And the BBC's Secunda Kamani was in one of these new Taliban strongholds, speaking to its fighters. How can you justify all this fighting when it's causing the deaths of thousands of ordinary Afghans, thousands of ordinary Muslims? No, you're the ones who started the fighting here, though. But while the Taliban was insisting on Islamic rule in Afghanistan, the UN was speaking out against its progress. Women are already being you know, killed and shot for breaching rules that have been imposed um, on their what they can wear and on where they can move uh, without a male escort. It's time for the international community to prioritize peace in Afghanistan. President Biden, though, was not shifting his position on the withdrawal. And he placed responsibility for controlling the situation in Afghanistan on its government. I think they're beginning to realize they've got to come together politically at the top. And, uh, but we're going to continue to keep our commitment. But I do not regret my decision. This was on the 10th of August. Also on the 10th of August, the Washington Post published this story. It showed us U.S. intelligence, which believed Kabul could fall to the Taliban within 90 days. 
But the next day, White House spokesperson Jen Psaki resisted the idea that the Taliban's momentum was unstoppable. We are closely watching the deteriorating security conditions in parts of the country, uh, but no particular outcome, in our view, is inevitable. So nothing is inevitable, said Jen Psaki. No regrets, said Joe Biden. And if that intelligence assessment said all could be lost in 90 days, it was to take far less than that. On the same day Jen Psaki was saying a Taliban victory was not inevitable, the Afghan president was trying to show as much. He travelled to the besieged city of mazar -e sharif And whatever boost he was hoping for, this was undercut by the surrender of hundreds of Afghan soldiers in nearby Kunduz. Because Afghans knew what Kunduz meant. If the Taliban could make it to Kunduz, maybe they could make it to Kabul, and that in itself is a big fear. The only good option would be if there's some kind of a political settlement. But what form would that settlement take? The Taliban's always refused to deal directly with the Afghan government, even while negotiating with the Americans. Would it really seek a political settlement now, with the Americans going and the Afghan military giving ground? No, was the answer. There was no political settlement. And by the 13th of August, this was the U.S. assessment. Kabul is not uh, right now um, uh, in an um, imminent threat environment. But clearly, David, uh, if you just look at what the Taliban's been doing, uh, you can see that they are trying to isolate Kabul. The threat to Kabul was certainly imminent by the next day, the 14th of August. The Taliban took Afghanistan's second largest city, Kandahar, as my colleague Yigita Lamai reported. This is the center of Kandahar city, a political and economic powerhouse. The Taliban were born in this province. To show off their gains, the group's fighters filmed themselves walking through the provincial governor's office. By this stage, there was little doubt that Kabul and the government could fall. Embassies started evacuating diplomats and civilians. The U.S. began sending thousands of U.S. troops to help with the evacuation. And as it did, Taliban fighters were reaching the outskirts of the capital. On Saturday the 14th, President Ghani addressed the nation. What Afghanistan? Our dear country, Afghanistan, is in serious danger of instability. The reintegration of the security and defense forces is our priority. And we are taking serious measures to deal with this. Whatever measures were taken, they weren't enough. On Sunday the 15th, the Taliban entered Kabul and met almost no resistance. It emerged President Ghani had fled the country. And a Taliban spokesperson called my colleague, Yalda Hakim, while she was live on BBC News. We want uh, to avoid bloodshed to destruction uh, to our uh, properties of the people and uh, to not to give chance to plunderers, uh, looters who are uh, waiting for such uh, moments to loot or plunder uh, the properties of the people. Nine days after seizing its first provincial capital, the Taliban had taken over. And there was perhaps no better illustration of its remarkable progress than these pictures of Taliban fighters sitting behind President Ghani's desk in the presidential palace. By the morning of Monday the 16th, the issue was not whether the Taliban was in control. It was. The immediate issue was the airport, as thousands of Afghans tried to get out. Extraordinary and harrowing footage emerged of people desperately trying to get onto planes, of US helicopters being used to clear people from the runway. And the people chasing one US plane down the runway while others clung to the fuselage. Hours after this, President Biden addressed Americans and he refused to accept mistakes had been made. I stand squarely behind my decision. After 20 years, I've learned the hard way that there was never a good time to withdraw US forces. That was Monday the 16th. On Tuesday the 17th, the Taliban gave a press conference and made its case. It is very understandable the international community is expressing worries about the security and about Afghanistan. But I reassure all internationals, the UN, all embassies, to all our neighbors, that we will not be allowing the soil of Afghanistan to be used against anybody. Those reassurances rang hollow for many, and there was growing fury that the Taliban should even be in a position to offer them. On Wednesday, we heard some of that fury as the House of Commons was recalled. And now it was Boris Johnson's turn to defend the withdrawal. 
The West could not continue this US-led mission, a mission conceived and executed in support and defence of America without American logistics, without US air power and without American might. And so, whatever the rights and wrongs of the withdrawal, this is the point we'd reached by Wednesday the 18th. The Taliban was now working to form a government. Some of its most senior leaders had arrived in the country. This was the welcome party for the Taliban's political leader in Kandahar. In Kabul, high-level meetings were happening about the transfer of power. Also on Wednesday, the ousted president, Ashraf Ghani, posted a video on Facebook. For now, I am in the United Arab Emirates so that bloodshed and chaos is stopped. I am currently in talks to return to Afghanistan. But any hope Mr Ghani has of returning to power looks slim. Minutes after that statement, the US said it no longer considers Mr Ghani a figure in Afghanistan. And rather than trying to seize power away from the Taliban, the Americans at the moment are much more concerned with the vast operation that's underway. Currently, the United States military is focused on the specific mission of conducting a non-combatant evacuation operation from Afghanistan. This is likely to be probably the second largest NEO conducted by the United States. And that operation very much focuses on Kabul airport. There we continue to see desperate scenes. Thousands of people continue to try and get into the airport and onto a flight. But as the Americans acknowledge, while they control the airport, they no longer control the entire process. The Taliban have informed us that they are prepared to provide the safe passage of civilians to the airport. And we intend to hold them to that commitment. And if the Americans have limited control over how people can get out now, there's a far longer-term loss of control to consider, too. On Wednesday evening in the U.S., Secretary of State Antony Blinken tweeted, Together with our international partners, we call on those in positions of power and authority across Afghanistan to guarantee the protection of women and girls and their rights. He goes on, we will monitor closely how any future government ensures their rights and freedoms. But as Mr Blinken well knows, it's the Taliban which is in power now, an organisation responsible for an array of atrocities all the way back to the 90s. And having spent 20 years fighting the US and its allies, you imagine having its human rights record monitored is of no concern. Because whatever the Western leaders say or tweet, the reality is their influence is dwindling and the democracy they helped create in Afghanistan is gone. It will be to China, Russia and Iran that the Taliban listens, not to the US or the UK or their NATO allies. It's an uncomfortable outcome after 20 years, billions of dollars and thousands of lives lost.